And now I'd like to introduce our special guest, Bonnie Anderson. Bonnie is a historian, author, and a scholar. She taught history and women's studies at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City of New York for over 30 years. Her latest book, The Rabbi's Atheist Daughter, Ernestine Rose, International Feminist Pioneer, and we have a copy of it here, is a fascinating and engaging read that will have you asking, why haven't I heard of Ernestine Rose before? Tonight, Bonnie will share her knowledge and insights on Ruth Bader Ginsburg as we celebrate the notorious RBG, a woman ahead of her time. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you very much. Um, the fact that you called her the notorious RBG, she is the only Supreme Court justice ever to be known by her initials. And it's not just because of the notorious B.I.G., it's because RBG has become a real feminist icon. And to give you visual proof, this was the New Yorker cover of October 5th of this year. It's completely black and her collar, which was such a standard, is made out of the symbols for women. So there she is. Um, she was not the first woman on the Supreme Court, that was Sandra, Sandra Day O'Connor, but she was the first feminist on the Supreme Court. None of the men, even though they did go along with many of her cases, was an actual out feminist, but Ginsburg was. She often cited Sarah Grimke, who was a mid 19th century women's rights person, uh, saying, I ask no favors for our sex, all I ask from our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Uh, before that, however, she often boasted that she was a Brooklynite born and bred. So it's very fitting that both a Brooklyn library is celebrating her and I myself spent my entire career at Brooklyn College. So I appreciate that. When she was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1993, by President Clinton, she paid tribute to her mother. And this is quite unusual. Most feminists that I wrote about never mentioned their mothers. And she said that her mother was the bravest and strongest person I have ever known. Unfortunately, her mother died when Ginsburg, or Bader as she was then, was only 17. And her mother said to her, don't trust anger. Anger doesn't accomplish anything. And as we'll see in her cases before the Supreme Court, she did not come on as an angry feminist. She came on as a logical, reasonable legal scholar who ended up proving to these nine justices that they had to go with her position. So the same year her mother died, she was at Cornell, she went to Cornell University. She met Marty Ginsburg, her husband of over 50 years and a wonderful supportive husband. He, uh, you know, she said, he cared that I had a brain. They married as soon as she graduated from college and he was supportive of her her entire life. He did the housework, he did the cooking. He was an eminent tax attorney in New York City and uh, he, took the primary care of the children, and he always backed her. And he was also a very funny guy. So it, it was a wonderful marriage. Um, in the early 50s, when she went to law school, there were very few women in law school in the United States of America. Uh, she was admitted to Harvard, which was, an, was and still is an eminent law school. And uh, she was one of nine women in a class of 535. When she was accepted, the Dean of Harvard Law School asked her, why are you taking a seat from a man? And I must say this sounded very familiar to me because that's exactly what I was asked when I applied to Columbia University Graduate School in 1965. So it took a long time for those kind of questions to be uh, you know, done away with. When I would tell my classes about things like that, They'd say, but that's illegal. And I'd say, yes, now it is, but it didn't used to be. This is the era when jobs were listed as help wanted male, help wanted female. You know, those of us old enough to remember that do. Um, when she was at law school, she made law review as one of the top 20 students in her class. And she also had her first child. So I think she was both 
almost a superwoman, but she also had a super husband to help her. Uh, Marty got a job in New York City and she transferred, uh, she was in her second year of law school and she moved to New York and graduated from Columbia. She that later said, not a law firm in New York bid for my employment as a lawyer when I earned my degree. She was told this firm does not hire women, which of course was legal then. Um, women could be fired for being pregnant, could automatically be excused from jury duty just for being a woman. The husband had to approve if a woman applied to get a credit card, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what led to a woman's movement in the late 60s and early 1970s. Before that, Ruth Bader Ginsburg got a job as a law professor at Rutgers and in 1967 taught a course on women and the law, which was really you know, pioneering in, in that, those years. Um, she then became a volunteer at the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, where she ran a women's rights project. She was very similar to her later fellow jurist, Thurgood Marshall, uh, in that she, um, she really advocated for the equal protection of the laws, as it says in the 14th Amendment. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, in 1973, she took the case Frontiero versus Richardson, where a female member of the Air Force did not get a housing allowance as men did. The woman was told that she was lucky to be in the Air Force at all. Why did she want a housing allowance? Ginsburg pleaded it before the Supreme Court and won eight to one. Her next case, and this shows how she approached um, choosing cases and arguing them, was called Weinberger versus Wiesenfeld. A wife had died and the husband could not get the benefits a wife would have had under social security. So Bader Ginsburg took that case and argued equal rights before the law and equal rights for a man as well as a woman. And she won that case nine to zero. And she won a number of other Supreme Court cases for women's equality. She saw herself, as she said, as a kindergarten teacher for the jurists. And she kept arguing before the Supreme Court that men and women should count equally before the law. When she was at the ACLU, she took the case of a young woman named Abby Sheldon, who was 15 years old. She was an ace tennis player and her high school in New Jersey did not have a women's tennis team. So she asked to be allowed to play with the men's tennis team and the high school wouldn't allow it. Um, New Jersey eventually agreed to let girls try out for boys team. This was obviously before Title IX had been passed. Um, but the, Selden later said the case gave her, quote, the courage to go on and go further and fight for myself. And I think that's Ginsburg's main contribution to our society, not just to men, to women, but to men as well. She won five of her six Supreme Court cases before she was a member of the court and arguing in part that putting women on a pedestal, which was a very common view in those years, you know, you're, you're privileged to be honored on a pedestal, she argued that the pedestal was really a cage, that it entrapped women, it prevented them from doing what they wanted to do, and it, the ground on a pedestal was very, very small indeed. Uh, in 1981, Jimmy Carter introduced, uh, I'm sorry, uh, appointed Sandra Day O'Connor to be the first woman on the court, but she was not a feminist. Um, and in 1980, he nominated Ginsburg to the US Court of Appeals. When she was nominated by President Clinton in 1993 to the Supreme Court, she argued before the full Senate that women have the right to abortion, to be able to control their own bodies since they are adults. She was confirmed 96 to three. In case you think this, there has been progress, uh, in 1996, a case came before the Supreme Court called the U.S. against Virginia about the Virginia Military Institute excluding women. It was the last state school to do that. And they argued that um, 
women just couldn't do the kind of curriculum that men could. Um, and a number of women wanted to apply. Um, it was the first women's rights case when Ginsburg was on the court as a jurist. And she, uh, you know, argued again for equal protection under the law. Uh, she said, you will be proud of your alumni to the Virginia Military Institute. They lost the case. And many years later, there was a celebration of her where many VMI women were in the fore in uniform. It was very impressive. By the 21st century, however, she moved into dissent as the court became more conservative. However, she was always friends with Antonin Scalia. And I, I, I have a funny memory of Antonin Scalia. His father had gone to Brooklyn College and when he died, donated his very large library of Italian American literature to Brooklyn College. So Scalia came up to the college to, you know, for the dedication of the library. And we organized a protest against him. And uh, I was standing on the, the road that goes through Brooklyn College and a group of Latinas came in shaking mariachis and chanting, you know, Scalia must go. And I heard Jur Judge Scalia turn to the president of Brooklyn College and say, can't you control your people better than that? And the answer was of course, no. Now, uh, moving, uh, she, her friendship with Scalia was genuine though. Both families said they really liked each other, even though they were always on opposite sides in the court and they both adored the opera. And uh, I think that was a real bond between them. But by the 21st century, she was very much in dissent. Uh, she was against Bush v. Gore, which decided that election by the Supreme Court. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. And she was against uh, the case Ledbetter versus Goodyear, where Lily Ledbetter had uh, been discriminated against by Goodyear Tire, uh, having a much lower salary than a man of equal rank. Uh, and the court ruled that she had not pled her case soon enough, that the time limit had run out. And Ginsburg argued that um, women often don't know that they've been discriminated against in salary because salaries are often kept secret. Um, it was Obama's first executive uh, uh, order to overturn the Ledbetter versus Good Goodyear verdict. In 2013, she voted against ending the, vo I'm sorry, she uh, argued against ending the Voting Rights Act. And she said, throwing out the act when it has worked is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. And I don't think you can be more appropriate than that. And look what's happened to voting rights in this nation since that act was gotten rid of. You know, one, one polling place in every county in Texas, one of Texas's counties is bigger than Rhode Island. And look at people, I mean, I didn't have to wait in line when I voted in Brooklyn. People waited in line for 10 hours voting early in Georgia. Unfortunately, in 1999, uh, Ginsburg got colorectal cancer, and that's when she starts working out. And if you've seen the wonderful documentary, uh, documentary of her life, RBG, you see her doing push-ups, and she's wearing a black sweatshirt with white letters saying diva. And she really goes through her paces. I mean, she did 25 real push-ups. She was very, very strong. In 2009, she got pancreatic cancer. A question that was often asked about her and of her was why didn't you retire when Obama was president? And there are the main reason she said was, I wanted to keep working as long as I was able. You know, for someone who had worked so hard to, to achieve that position, why should she step down? And also Obama only had a, a congressional majority in the first two years of his term of his two terms, so that they probably would have voted down a successor who was like her. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as you know, the cancer continued. At one point, Ginsburg called Trump a faker, and she later apologized for that because Supreme Court justices are not supposed to express opinions about the current president. Uh, so she later apologized and she said, now I have to stay alive. 
Her death this year was both timely and untimely. Timely because she had fought cancer for so long and untimely, of course, because Trump got to appoint a third justice. So now I'd like to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny. Okay. So does anyone have a question? They can just unmute yourself. Um, I have a question. Oh, hi, Gilly. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm from uh, Australia, so I don't actually understand the president appointing um, justices, uh, judges. Could you just run, run me through that? Briefly, very brief. I know it's probably very complicated, but... No, it isn't, it, actually. In fact, years ago, I had a real argument with an Englishman because he said, the Supreme Court rules your country. And I said, no, it doesn't. Um, the president has the right to appoint someone to be a Supreme Court justice, but the Senate must approve that person. Now, you may remember, or I certainly the Americans will remember that, what was it, three years ago? or no, it was when Obama was still president. Obama's last year as president, he picked a very moderate justice, Merrick Garland and Mitch McConnell, I won't say anything about him, uh, argued that the people should decide. So he was not going to allow the Senate to vote on Garland, but wait eight months for an election. The hypocrisy of shoving through Amy Coney Barrett, when G Ginsburg had not even been buried and an election had already gotten underway, about half of Americans have already voted. And the Republican Senate voted for her, every Democrat voted against her, and she was confirmed yesterday. So less than that the news. Yeah. You know. So I'm guessing she's very Trump-like or conservative or <laughs> She's very conservative in her previous opinions and she hasn't been honest about her previous opinions. You know, she wrote an article arguing that abortion shouldn't be allowed in this country. And when asked about it, she said, that's a judicial matter. I can't comment on it as I'm going to be, you know, perhaps have cases being brought before me on that area. The thing I hold against her most, uh, and again, this was not even raised in question by the Senate, is her, she belongs to a sect of Catholicism called People of Praise. One tenet of People of Praise is that there should be no separation of church and state. Another is that the wife should obey her husband. Now, <laughs> if I were there, I would have asked her about that. Um, and maybe she, she doesn't obey her husband and maybe she does believe there should be separation of church and state, but it's, a, it's an odd religion to belong to. Someone wrote that if she were a Muslim woman, she would not have gotten that far. Mm, yes. Well, thank you. Thanks for enlightening that, enlightening me. I've really enjoyed hearing about this amazing woman. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Anyone else want to ask a question? I'll ask a question. <laughs> um, Thanks, Linda. Bonnie, uh, with your vast, amazing knowledge, can you talk a little bit about the, I keep hearing that the court hasn't been this conservative since the 1930s, or can you talk about like the history of, or give some sense of the history of the, the kind of political um, balance of the court or a lack thereof? and when it was so conservative, how that was rectified and whose administration? Okay, well, um, there are two things I can say because honestly, I'm not a, a scholar of the Supreme Court. The court was much more conservative in the late 1850s. And here I would point to the Dred Scott decision of 1857. Uh, the South, which had much more power in those years because there weren't as many states, right? So there were a number, you know, Southern states almost balanced out Northern states. And they passed a law called the Fugitive Slave Act, where if a, 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 an enslaved person had been able to escape to the North, uh, white Southerners could come North 
imprison him and bring him back to the South. And Dred Scott was such a person. They also occasionally kidnapped uh, free blacks in the North and brought them to the South to be enslaved. The Supreme Court in 1857 ruled that Dred Scott was not a human being, but rather a piece of property. And we know how that ended, right? It ended in civil war. And I have to tell you that I have never, I, I really feel that the, this period with its partisanship that extends even to the wearing of masks uh, most resembles the period just before the civil war. Now on a slightly more hopeful note, in the late 1930s, a man named Hugo Black was appointed Supreme Court Justice. And uh, Hugo Black was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And by the 1960s, he had evolved into being a very liberal justice who believed in integration. So people can change. And I think, for instance, that John Roberts has changed. I don't know how much, but uh, you can't uh, assume that everybody is going to always remain in the same position. But I'd say in recent years, the court has definitely moved to the right. Thank you. Yes, I wanted your, your sense of hopefulness <laughs> <laughs> at this bleak moment. Yeah, well, I mean, let's hope for a landslide. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that packing the court is the right decision, but on the other hand, there's nothing in the constitution that says the court has to be nine people. What I believe in is the court is not the final power in this nation, Congress is. Congress is the legislative branch. So let's say the court does something like outlaws abortion or um, gets away with the, afford, you know, does away with the Affordable Care Act. Congress can override the court by passing laws. There's nothing in the constitution about abortion. So if Congress passed a law saying abortion should be legal in the United States of America, the court could not take the case because it is not a constitutional issue. So that's that's what gives me hope. Vote, vote, vote. <laughs> and I think Ma Mara has a question. Moira? Yes. Mara? Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. I sort of I think I unmuted and muted in the same in, in the same second. But um, thank you, Bonnie, for such a fascinating talk and for such you know hopeful and um, thoughtful information and also, of course, the reminder of how important it is to vote. Um, and I wonder, I was struck during the parts of Amy Coney Barrett's testimony that I heard by how little she actually revealed of what she thought and, you know, what her judicial beliefs actually were or, mm -hmm. you know, what her legislative, you know, what her sense of how the law should work. And um, I wonder, that seemed unusual to me. And I wondered how, I mean, if, if that is, if you, if you think that is unusual for the way that justices normally behave in their confirmation hearings, and also how we can sort of move, it's always fascinated me that Ginsburg and Scalia were such good friends. And I'm, I wonder how I know this is less of a historical question, but like, how can we get back to some of that so that, you know, the justices on the court will act sort of more broadly than their own personal interests and how we can kind of re reclaim that sense of, of um, if not nonpartisan, then at least maybe bipartisan uh, way of, of kind of making decisions. Okay. Well, let me begin with, with uh, candidates not wanting to reveal their opinions. I think a lot of that comes from the case of Robert Bork. Oh, yeah. Remember, uh, it, 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 for a while it was a verb being borked, right? right. Um, he was a very loquacious uh, judge. And when he was in hearings before the Senate, he 
expressed his opinions very vociferously and he was voted down. And I think since then, uh, candidates have been much less talkative in front of the Senate. So that's one factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of bipartisanship, it's one reason I like Biden because I think he is yeah. really, oh, what a cute baby, <laughs> really um, <laughs> trying to be as bipartisan as he possibly can. Yeah. You know, when he talks about there aren't red states and blue states, there's the United States. That's right. I mean, I think that's the only way that we can get past uh, this terrible divisive time. Yeah. Um, my un unfortunately dead brother was a Trump supporter. Mm -hmm. And the day after Obama was elected, he said, but where was he born? I said, don't even start with me. Uh -huh. I will cream you. <laughs> but we remained brother and sister. Of we course. remained friends. We just avoided talking about politics. And I think that's what a, a lot of Americans have done. Um, I used to go on bike trips, which I loved. And on one bike trip, someone asked the guide, what's the worst thing that's ever happened on a bike trip, not an accident? And she said, I can tell you exactly. It was the opening night dinner where people are just getting to know each other. And one man said, so what does everyone think should be done to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? <laughs> and Meg said, how about them Red Sox? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that became a formula between Peter and myself, my brother yeah. and myself. And he, he wanted, he came from Pittsburgh, he lived in Pittsburgh, so he wanted to change it to how about them Steelers, but we kept it with the Red Sox. And it worked, it worked, yeah. yeah. Uh -oh. So that's a good way to start. And, you know, especially if you're sharing your table for Thanksgiving with people who don't agree with you politically. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I have a question, Bonnie, yeah. since, I, um, since I really enjoyed reading your book over the weekend um, about Ernestine Rose. Thank so, you. Yes. How would you say that she um, was able to pave the way for someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Absolutely. I know she well, was about 100 years before. I heard a wonderful talk by Judith Rosenbaum, who's head of the Jewish Women's Archives. And for a number of years, because of writing about Rose, I was on the board of the Jewish Women's Archives, which is a wonderful institution. You can go to their website and find marvelous things. And Rose was an outlier. She was a foreigner. She was the only foreigner in the early American women's movement. In the middle of the 19th century, she was better known than Stanton or Anthony. She was a marvelous public speaker. Uh, she had been born in Poland, uh, the daughter of a rabbi. And when she was 15, her mother died and left her some money and her father betrothed her to a man she didn't want to marry. Now that was absolutely standard in those years because parents, Jewish and not, felt that teenagers were not, you know, wise enough to pick their own spouses. Uh, she pleaded with the man to release her from the engagement and, she, and he said, well, you're rich and you're beautiful. Why should I do that? And he went to a court uh, about 60 miles away in Poland to plead for his rights to her dowry. She followed him. She hired a sleigh, uh, took it, it in the winter in Poland, the sleigh breaks down. She sits and it set, the sleigh driver says, let's wait till tomorrow. And she said, no, my case is coming to the court tomorrow, go get help. And she sits in the sled and hearing howls of, uh, you know, packs of wolves while she waits. She gets to the court, she pleads her own case and she wins. They give her the money, she goes back home and her father has married a woman her own age. And she gives him some of the money, she decides that she is gonna leave and she leaves Poland, her family and Judaism forever. And she lives first in Paris, then she goes to London. And in London, she follows a very interesting man named Robert Owen, who was an early socialist. He had run a major factory in, in England and she meets her husband and they emigrate to New York City. And she's in the United States from 1836 to 1869. And as I say, she's a complete outlier. 
She's an atheist, the only one. Mm -hmm. It was amazing to me how religious the early women's movement was. I mean, they would always sing hymns. They would have prayers at the meetings. They would appeal to Jesus to back their cause. And they, they argued quite cogently that the Bible supported women's rights. Um, and she made friends. She was a very interesting, good humored woman. Uh, a, a, an evangelical came up to her and said, I'm sure we will meet in heaven. And Rose said, in that case, I will say how stupid I was and you will be able to laugh at me. You know, so <laughs> she had a great sense of humor. And uh, unfortunately, she's been almost completely forgotten. In 1925, when she'd been dead about 40 years, a Jewish publication said, only one Jew in a thousand has ever heard of Ernestine Rose. But I think it's because she was Jewish, she was an atheist, she was a foreigner, and she was a feminist. And I wrote the book in order to have people hear about her nowadays, because she's an amazing foremother. She really is. Marge, did you have a question? Uh, well, you know, I'm just, it, it seems like, uh, unfortunately, I mean, you can comment on it. I don't have a question exactly, but it's amazing how to be a feminist makes you an outlier almost. You know, um, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems the the strongest feminists to me, like uh, Gloria Stein and, and Ruth, their North Star is just simply equality for women. I, I don't know if you agree that or with that, or are there other women you could say that about? Oh, I think, I think you can say that, but um, I used to teach a course on the history of feminism at Brooklyn College, mm -hmm. and I called it the F word. <laughs> and I would start the class by saying, now, I, I can't see you. I, tur I turn my back to the class. I, I, this is so long ago, I was still using chalk and a blackboard. And I said, just shout out your associations with the word feminism. And I would get lesbian, unshaven legs, ugly, uh, <laughs> no, you can't find a man, you know, all the, all the cliches. And a lot of the class was spent disproving them. And, you know, a lot of it was me in front of the room, you know, because I was obviously not those things. And I tried to hide my sexual identity. I was in effect married twice to men, um, but I didn't do it completely successfully because <laughs> people said, I didn't think you would lie to us. You know, I, I, I couldn't remember all the times I'd mentioned a husband or something like that. <laughs> but um, I do think that many, many women are feminists. They just don't like the stigma of the word. You know, do you believe in equal pay for equal work? Of course. Do you believe that you should have the right to get a credit card? Of course. You know, all sorts of things that go to compose feminism. And yet the word itself is still quite stigmatized. Can that be changed? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I think the New Yorker cover was great. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that the New Yorker is a right-wing magazine, but that collar that has, is made up of the symbols for women, right? you know, is really a feminist cover. Yeah. So I have hope. <laughs> well, you know, I, I see the world today when so many women are in law school, in medical school, you know, there used to be a joke and I haven't been able to quite remember it, but it was not a very funny joke. It was someone is injured and goes to the hospital and the doctor says, I can't operate. And you, you don't realize in those years that the surgeon is a woman. You know, you can't figure out the puzzle. And nowadays, of course, it wouldn't even be a puzzle. It wouldn't even be an issue. You know, so there has been a great deal of progress in my lifetime. And uh, look at the progress on gay rights. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. Uh, it was so stigmatized. And now you can talk about her wife or his husband. Yeah. So, and that's due to the Supreme Court. <sighs> so I, uh, I did a blurb for a wonderful book called We the Resilient. Women born before women had the vote. 
So it was women in their 90s and 100s. And they were all <laughs> kinds of women, all from all over the United States, all races, all ethnicities, all professions. There was one who had been a fan dancer. <laughs> and they basically said, uh, look, we lived through the Great Depression. We lived through World War II. We lived through the McCarthy era. Keep on keeping on. Mm. Don't, don't let people make you give up what you truly believe in and just mm. keep on doing it. So that's my hope. Yeah. I wonder, Bonnie, this is Maura. I wonder whether, um, you know, some of the emphasis recently on intersectionality might help destigmatize feminism. You know, and the, the sense that all of these justice issues need to be seen as connected. Um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Black well, Lives Matter, you know, kind of all the linkages people are making. I think intersectionality is a great concept and one that was new to me as new, new to most of us. But we're not just one thing. You know, we're not just a woman. We're not just white. We're not just Jewish. We're right. all of those right. things and many others as well. And I think we have to act in that regard. So yes, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Thank you. I have a comment on the hope thing. <laughs> okay. I, I have hope because I don't know what's happening over there, but over here, um, with sports, women are now starting to get paid equally to be professional sporting players in soccer, cricket, football. So, and that's unheard of in previous years. Mm -hmm. And it's unheard of for on TV um, in prime time for there to be women's sport um, being played. Um, so women's football and women's cricket and my son who's eight he now puts up posters of the women's cricket team on his wall oh which, wonderful wonderful when i was growing up i didn't even know i mean i played cricket in the backyard i played sport but i'd never really even thought that women could play it professionally and be paid and it was just never in my realm so i have hope now because where I live in Brisbane, our women's football team is better than the men's and all of, all these, I'm seeing all these social media posts of, you know, 40 plus men saying how good it is that we've at least got one good team, you know, <laughs> that's the women's team. So, you know, it's, a, it's just one aspect of life, but I have hope seeing that, that these boys and my daughter are growing up watching this, that, you know, it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think there's another factor. I don't think the United States is now the, the leader of the free world anymore. Right. I think there's so many areas in which we are learning from other nations about how to be. And here's Australia with its sporting teams. Look at uh, Europe. I mean, in much of, of Europe, uh, not Poland, but the rest of Europe, contraception is automatically given out free in high schools. Oh. So they don't have an issue about abortion because everybody has contraception. You know, the idea that abortion is a burning issue in the United States is something I'm often asked about when I go to Europe because they don't understand it. And I must say the second that uh, pro-life was coined, I thought the women's movement should have fought on the issue of contraception because virtually every American believes in contraception. And, you know, a lot of anti-abortion people don't. So I think we need to, to follow more progressive nations and not uh, assume that we're, we know best. Well, I've only just real, I've only just learned that it's still criminalized here in Australia or in my state at least, abortion. It's freely available but it's still criminalized. So that doctors that perform it can still, you know, be charged, but they're not. But it shocked me only about year, a couple of years ago when I, I realized that it wasn't actually fully a legal right. <laughs> I just... Well, I wrote a blog, which you can read about on my website when the state of Alabama passed uh, a provision which uh, didn't, did not succeed. Um, 
that a doctor who performed an abortion should be put in jail for 100 years. Uh, and uh, when uh, Barrett was confirmed, a friend said to me, I think they're gonna overturn Griswold v. Connecticut. Well, Griswold v. Connecticut was the uh, case that gave contraceptive rights to married couples. I said, I don't think it's gonna be overturned. You know, but um, that's, that's where we are now. Um. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, Bonnie, there's a question from another Bonnie, who's a high school, um, a high school teacher. And she says, she wants to know what's the one thing that a high school student should learn about Ruth Bader Ginsburg? And do you recommend any particular um, writings about her, about Actually, RBG? I would recommend seeing the film RBG, the, the, the documentary. It's just wonderful. And it's not that long. I don't know actually about, you know, uh, I, there is a book called The Notorious RBG that's terrific, but the film is wonderful and I would show it to my classes. Great. And if anyone's interested, I know that the documentary is on Hulu. <laughs> oh, <laughs> also, okay. it's on Hulu. And they just came out the Young Readers edition of The Notorious RBG. Uh huh. So, Bonnie, that might be something um, your students might want to tackle. I am um, happily retired. Oh, the other Bonnie, right? <laughs> oh yeah, the, the other Bonnie. <laughs> That's wonderful. So thank you so much for joining us. Does anyone want to make a last comment or feel free to unmute yourself? And thank you so much, Bonnie. We really appreciate you taking thank the time. You. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great.